Merhaba, benim my name is Sad, and welcome back to some more Bosnian Reacts to Geography Now Turkey or Turkey, Turkey, whatever they renamed it. Um, but yeah, this is an episode that many have been awaiting, including myself. This is another major country on the list of many sovereign states. This is the most powerful Muslim nation in the world, and boy, does it have a tale to tell. Whew. I'm going to be talking a lot in this one, I can already tell you that, but um, we have a lot to say. Now, okay, first, beforehand, I want to clear something up. Bosniaks are good friends with Turks. We are not Turks. Don't listen to, like, uh, nationalist propaganda. We are good friends of them. Bosniaks were Slavic Muslims. We're proud of being that. And uh, Turks are Turks. We're good friends with them. Okay. None of that in the chat, please. But regardless, I think um, I'll just hop right into the video. Let's see. Geography now. Turkey. I need to do some, do some breathing exercises because, <laughs> oh, I'm going to be talking a lot. Probably. Hey, Geography Peeps, Barb's here. Get your Geography Now merch at geographynow.com. So for this episode, you're going to notice that uh, there's going to be some continuity errors. For example, I'm clean shaven here. In the episode, I'm not. That's because uh, for this episode, I had to that film out to of sequence too. over the course of two weeks in five different countries. It's However, long wrong. story short, these days, I'm trying to kind of travel to the last countries of our alphabet. And you know, I found a really good cheap flight ticket to Turkey. So uh, long story what short, it kind of ended up going like this. Hey, Mom. What? Want to go to Turkey? What? Hadikoy, Istanbul. Yeah, I went to Turkey for this episode. It's time I mean, to learn geography. No! I could probably right, hitch like a flight to Turkey and Here's be there in like two hours. On location. Here we are in Turkey. I'm going to feature a lot of you guys, the Turkish geography peeps, in this video as well. And who better to feature than my go-to Turk, Mr. Ege, a.k.a. Ege Boy. Hell yeah, man. So I actually met Ege a few years ago when Looks I, like I did the heritage trip. We had an 18-hour layover Smash. in Istanbul. <laughs> I was 14. Yeah, you were like 14. I don't usually meet up with kids unless they have, uh, you know, an adult supervisor. I you, did. You had your aunt. I don't want to be the creepy guy that meets up with kids. You're like a chubby little kid, and now you're like a emo punk rock star. Look at you, man. You grew up. Uh, thank you. I promised him five years ago he could be in the Turkey episode. You kept English is very kept nice. Kept my promise. <laughs> you're the best, man. Five years later. That was a bad That was the worst high five ever. Well, Ege drove me around parts of Turkey and helped with this video, so he's going to co-host. Also, you are officially the youngest person ever to co-host a Geography Now episode. Hey, man. So, I'm just 19. Yeah, there you go. Well, Eggy boy, you ready to pop this turkey into the oven? Oh, yeah, you're getting full meal with this episode. <laughs> full meal. <laughs> My God, that's so the domain that Turkey sits on today is riddled with thousands of years of transition Paul, and the map. Turn those the down. Our land has always been the junction point between so many cultures, eras, and empires throughout history. It would take way too long to explain, but basically, but explain. it goes all the way back to somewhere around 10,000 BC in one of the oldest known towns on Earth, Çatalhöyük, dating about 6200 BC, was established there. And from there, it was like the Bronze Age, the Hittites, the Phrygians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, Seljuks, Ottomans, and then finally the Republic that stands today. Lots of stuff. First, let's jump into the map and see what turkey administers today turkey is okay ooh. <coughs> oh oh this is gonna be oh here we go the turks their oldest ancestors that we can think of well technically from africa but they're from the proto-turkic people groups all the way originating from eastern siberia and of course they uh, traverse the steppe regions of central asia another people group a more turkic group known as the gok turks they took over a Basically all of the steppe region that you can think of, of Central Asia, Mongolia, etc. Uh, because they were very good horsemen, horse archers, and one of those groups that would later uh, emerge are known as the Seljuk Turks. We've probably heard of them before. They're the creators of the Seljuk Empire, of the Seljuk uh, Empire, of course. Now, they originated, as far as we know, somewhere around the uh, eastern Caspian Sea, where today's uh, Turkmenistan, possibly Kazakhstan, and parts of Uzbekistan, they were excellent warriors. That's something that nomadic uh, horsemen were very good at, and eventually slowly started taking over parts of today's Iran, Azerbaijan, uh, those areas, e eastern Anatolia, etc. They created their own 
empire, the Seljuk Empire. As always with empires, uh, over time, after the good rulers die, the bad rulers take over, uh, it starts falling apart from the inside, not to mention a Mongol horde invasion. Before but before the Seljuks came, of course, uh, they accepted Islam. It was long ago that uh, the Turks actually accepted Islam. I believe they uh, went to some place and... Like the leader of the Seljuk Turks, which was named Seljuk Khan, literally the one who led the Seljuks, uh, which gave the, norms, the name to the Seljuk Turks, uh, went to some city, I believe, in uh, Afghanistan, today's Afghanistan, and accepted Islam as a religion, and then they started expanding. Okay, just to clarify that, how they accepted Islam, accepted it a long, long, long time ago, a thousand years ago. And they ended up settling in, in many, many regions of eastern Anatolia because... Eastern Anatolia is somewhat semi-arid, you know, just like how Central Asia would be. Good for uh, pasturing, good for uh, horses, you know, the things that uh, the uh, Seljuk Turks were, were good at. Now, the people who occupied the areas of, of then Eastern Anatolia, the Byzantines, didn't really just invite them in. Uh, the Seljuk Empire expanded, through, especially one very important battle, the Battle of Manzikert is when the Turks started really pushing into today's Anatolia, which is basically just this peninsula that you see here. It's Anatolia, if you didn't know already. Um, so, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but the Byzantines mostly kept control, or the Greeks, basically, were in control of the coastal regions of Anatolia at the, at the time. Uh, the Seljuk, still some more Seljuk Turks started um, emigrating towards eastern Anatolia. Uh, like I said, the Greeks still mostly were in control of the coastline. So that also led uh, to the Christians not being very happy with uh, uh, such a, you know emigration of peoples to the eastern Anatolia, which was, you know, historical uh, Christian land. Uh, so they uh, decided to call upon many crusades. Okay, this is one of the reasons the first crusade uh, happened. Uh, it was semi-successful, ended up creating some Christian kingdoms. Uh, in the eastern Mediterranean coastline, uh, it fell quickly later on. Uh, until after then, all basically all the other crusades were horrible failures. A lot of the crusades uh, the Turks would have to fight off successfully, very very successfully. So uh, and one Turkic state ended up becoming very prominent. Uh, this is known as the Sultanate of Rum, R U M, not. Not rum, okay, like the alcoholic beverage, but rum, okay. So it's in it of rum. And everything was fine and dandy for hundreds of years until one major event caused a giant uh, surge of emigration towards uh, the western parts of Anatolia. Uh, this was the Mongolic invasion. Many people groups were fleeing uh, the genocidal uh, Mongols, and they ended up settling in areas of Anatolia, which drastically increase the population of the Turks in the area. Okay, so Mongols' empire falls apart later on, and you would have a many Beyliks, uh popping up in Anatolia. Beyliks were basically like uh, small kingdoms, small Turkic kingdoms, uh, some of which maybe you all have heard of, like Karaman, for example, uh, Chandar, I believe, in like northern Anatolia. But one of these Beyliks, and one of the leaders of these uh, Beyliks, would become one of the most popular figures in all of uh, Turkish history. Turkish, not Turkic. There's a difference, by the way. I'll just get into that right now. There's a difference between Turkish and Turkic. Turkish people are Turkic, but not all Turkic people are Turkish. There we go. Uh, his name was Osman I. The leader of uh, a small Beylik around the area of today's... Uh, uh, Western Anatolia near Bursa. Later on, Bursa would be the first capital of the Ottoman Empire because uh, Osman I started taking up, taking territory from the Byzantine Empire and started conquering other Beyliks or other Turkish Beyliks and started really expanding the empire. And before they took out the Byzantine Empire once and for all, which was crumbling way before even the the Turks, uh, you know, entered the region. Uh, there were many bubonic pl plagues and fight and um, uh, wars with the Persians and the Arabs, the Muslim Arabs. So the Byzantine Empire was already on its way out even before the the Turkish, but, but the Turks really put the nail in the coffin for, to the, for the Byzantine Empire. They pass into today's uh, 
Bulgaria, easier territory to conquer than trying to get through the Theodosian walls of the still very, you know, prosperous uh, Byzantine capital of Constantinople. And they just kept expanding more and more, like other other very intelligent, very ambitious sultans started taking over after Osman I. Uh, it was anglicized into the Ottomans instead of the Osmans, I guess. So that's why we call them the, the Ottoman Empire instead of the Osman Empire. It was named after Osman I, or Osman, I guess, as you, how you would properly pronounce his name. So it was then in 1453 that Mehmed Fahti, or Mehmed the Conqueror, as many people know, know him as, uh, led his troops to victory. Funny story how they actually ended up taking Constantinople finally, but they took it over and it is today's Istanbul. Yeah, it was former Constantinople, is today's Inst Istanbul. Uh, they didn't rename it to Istanbul at the time. By the way, Istanbul is a Greek word, funnily enough. But they actually just called it Constantinia. You know, the Turkish version of Constantinople, basically. And they finished off what was left of the Byzantine Empire in uh, what's today Western Greece, and they expanded in every possible direction, including the Balkans, including the Middle East. They defeated the Mamluks, they took over Hejaz, they ended up almost being defeated by the, uh, the Timurids, led by Tamerlane himself. That was way before the was it before or during when the Ottoman Empire was expanding? But uh, the Timurids actually defeated him in the on the fields of Ankara, and it ended up um, taking the then Sultan as as hostage, and he ended up dying in under mysterious circumstances. But uh, for what, whatever reason, Tamerlane didn't decide to finish off the Ottomans when he had the the chance. But eh, history might have been different. Who knows? But. They started spreading in every every possible direction. They ended up taking many vassals, including Wallachia, Moldova, the Crimean Khaganate. They were good friends with the Moroccans. You name, they were basically everywhere. It was the mighty Ottoman Empire, and it reached a, the peak of its uh, power near the seven, the end of the seventeenth century. Now, there are many reasons why the mighty Ottoman Empire started to decline rapidly. Uh, one in due in large because of corruption that was taking hold in the country, weak leadership, especially after Suleiman the Magnificent died. By the way, my last name is Suleimanovich, so it was taken from Suleiman the the Magnificent. I'm hardly as smart as he was, or Suleiman Kanuni, as he was known in Turkish, or the lawgiver, basically, because he wrote to very prominent laws that would remain in power throughout the rest of the uh, life of the Ottoman Empire. Now, uh, they were being outcompeted by the Europeans because the Europeans discovered the New World. They found a way around Africa so they have, wouldn't have to use uh, the Ottoman Empire anymore. It was still important, but not nearly as important as it was anymore. They started, uh, the Ottoman Empire started falling back in terms of technology. It was very difficult for them to adapt because uh, even though the printing press was long since, you know, invented the... Uh, the Turkish uh, Ottomans, they uh, just couldn't bear, you know, the printing of books. They they really couldn't handle that because if if uh, too many books get print, printed, a lot of the other people groups in the area would get ideas like how to achieve their independence and who they are as, <laughs> as peoples. So they kept it to a minimum. You can print books, but only a certain amount of books, which means they definitely fell back in terms of science, even though they were pretty advanced for their time in the early 1500s let's say scientifically they started falling back when it comes to technology when it comes to tactics they could just never reform because the janissaries literally one time they even killed the sultan so the janissaries would never allow them to reform the army to make a more modern army it just had its problems and after a long gruesome Fall throughout the 1800s, 1900s, and around the early 1900s, the Ottoman Empire finally fell. It was the sick man of Europe. Little by little, it started losing territories for a myriad of reasons. And, th and then enters uh, the Young Turks led by Enver Pasha, which were the more conservative, the ones that wanted to implement a constitutional monarchy. Then you have, of course, the legendary Ataturk, Kemal Mustafa Ataturk himself, who created successfully the uh, 
Republic of Turkey, after defeating uh, six different powerful enemies, uh, he ended up uniting the country, and in 1923, Turkey gained its independence. hundred years later, here we are today. Oh my god. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> oh, I feel... wow. There's still more to tell in detail, but I just gave you the gist of how Turkey got here. It was a long, long story short, that's where we are today. Is a transcontinental country located right at what is considered the boundaries between Europe and Asia. The vast majority of the country lies on the Anatolian Peninsula, straddled between the Black Sea to the north, the Mediterranean to the south, and the Aegean to the west. This is considered the Asia part of Turkey. In antiquity, it was even called Asia Minor. As for the Europe part, we go to the Thrace Peninsula, which connects to the Balkans, separated by the Bosphorus Strait, the Sea of Marmara, and the Dardanelles up the Gallipoli Peninsula from the Asia part of the country. The Thrace Peninsula only makes up 3% of the country's landmass, yet it holds about 10% of the country's population. That's the country's Istanbul capital is. and second largest city is Ankara, also known as Angora in antiquity, and is located more inland in the Anatolian Peninsula. Okay, now initially, yeah, it was Istanbul that was the capital of Turkey, but when Kemal Mustafa Atatürk came into power, he moved it to Ankara, because Ankara is more, you know, in the center of the country besides Istanbul. So, and he also wanted more you know, wealth dispersion in the inland areas of Anatolia. That's what, some, something similar to what Brazil or Nigeria is doing, you know, moving their capital more inland in a centralized location. Uh, because before then, well, there were like cities uh, here and there in central Anatolia, but most people actually live on the coast coastline of Anatolia. That's where the largest um, cities are, like Istanbul and Izmir. The largest, busiest, world-renowned financial hub and only transcontinental city in the world, though, would be the city of Istanbul. Classified as a mega city, it straddles oh, both yeah. the European and Asian sides people. of the country across the, the Bosphorus. Million, in antiquity, it was also known as Lagos, Byzantium, and Constantinople until it changed its name in 1928. Istanbul, of course, also hosts the busiest shipping port, the port of Haider Pasha, as well as the biggest and busiest airport, the newly finished Istanbul International, One of the located biggest on the north the side world. of the city. If you flew to Istanbul prior to 2019, you probably arrived in Atatürk International on the south side before they transferred all passenger operations to the new airport and made Atatürk a cargo hub. Otherwise, the country is divided into 81 provinces or vilayet. Off the western coast in the Aegean, you notice there's a lot of islands. However, interestingly enough, all but two of them actually belong to Greece. These two right here. This was due to the Treaty of Athens in 1913, which clarified sovereignty over the Aegean. This has been a source of contention for maritime boundaries and access for Turkish ships trying to leave the west coast, and today it's still to a little complicated. Day. Nonetheless, Turks come and visit these islands all the time. It's not like there's a crazy conflict going on. Speaking of which, there's another dispute that they have with Syria over the Hatay province. This Seriously? was the last province to join the Republic in 1939. Syria never formally recognized the referendum that the French officiated that gave it to Turkey, and today Syrian maps still show the Hatay province as theirs. Also, fun side note, we all know Turkey has a town named Batman, <laughs> in which the mayor literally tried to sue the director of Batman because but Turkey also has some funny <laughs> literal translated names. Yeah. These, uh, here, why don't you just go through some of them? Bulukesir, fish prisoner. Adiyaman, its name is bad. That literally means its name is bad. Yeah. Tokat, slap. It's, it just means slap. <laughs> and the last one, Opium Black Fortress. Opium Black Fortress. Yeah. It's where opium grows. In any case, going back to history, though, Black Istanbul Fortress. was essentially the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Barbarians invaded from the Danube. Arabs came from the southeast. Even some Slavs came in from the Black Sea coast. It was Did I do everywhere. that? It wasn't until the 11th century you started to see fir the first Turkic peoples fully settling in what is now in Turkey, starting with the Seljuk Empire, which was actually proso turkic but you get the point. So many things went back and forth until the 14th century when Osman I initiated the Ottoman Empire in the Bursa province area. You've probably heard of the Ottoman Empire. It lasted for about 600 years no. until the Balkan <laughs> Wars leading up to World War I, when all hell broke loose. The Treaty of Sev, which was signed and essentially attempted to carve out what was left amongst the Allies from the Turkey Anatolia Peninsula. Uh, it was actually worse than this map makes it out to be. Uh, I'll, I'll try to put up on screen if I remember during editing to put it up. It should be right there. Yeah, that's actually what the um, Ottomans were to be left with. And uh, if it wasn't for really Ataturk, no kidding, the Turks really love him. If it wasn't for him, I don't know, Turkey wouldn't be nearly as powerful as it is uh, today. So, yeah. Peninsula. The thing is though, it's incredibly hard to carve out the hard and nucleus of an empire, aka the Anatolian Peninsula. 
not easy. In comes Ataturk. This guy is basically the father of modern Turkey who fought against partition forces and wanted to salvage the Anatolian Peninsula as a new Turkish Republic that would modernize, industrialize, and secularize, even though many people would still maintain Islamic core values. This would essentially make them the first Muslim majority country to have secularism embedded in its constitution and a clause that stated that it could not be removed. And there have been five coups throughout history on the grounds that these principles were in danger. Anyway, back to the early 20th century, it's the so transition much. from the Ottoman times to the Republic times was followed by lots of fighting, paranoia, proxy intervention, displacement practices, and bloodshed. We'll talk more about this later in the episode, but here's the deal. Whenever we make this bell sound, it means here are the Cliff Notes version of a hot button topic that we will not go too far into and you are welcome to discuss it in the comments. Obviously, we assume you will be writing civil words in lowercase letters. Of course. <laughs> of course. Until then, moving on. Okay, uh, what else do we have, Ege? Uh, well, Turkey joined NATO in 1952. It also invaded Northern Cyprus in 1974. And yeah, so uh, Ataturk, uh, specifically uh, Ataturk, uh, he uh, actually was an atheist. For those who don't know, so that's why he led, you know, a decided to go with a secular constitution. Also, Ataturk was actually from Greece, from Salonika, today's Thessaloniki, uh, in uh, Greece. So, but I believe his grandparents, don't quote me on this, their, his grandparents originated from North Macedonia. Then they moved to Greece. Then, of course, he moved to Turkey. Uh, regarding the whole Northern Cyprus thing, it's very complicated. I'm reading very various different sources that, you know, say something else. But as far as I could tell, there was always going, there was always like a bit of um, tension going on in Cyprus. It's a very strategically located island in the Eastern Mediterranean, mostly settled by ethnic Greeks. And then it, Greece wanted it, wanted Cyprus to be fully a part of Greece, uh, due in large that most of the island is ethnically Greek. However, there were, uh, literally, this is what I'm reading from sources, there were, there was talk of a potential communist coup going on there. And the United, that's why the United States allowed such a thing to happen, a war to uh, happen between uh, two NATO allies, because they thought Cyprus was about to become communist or something, so the G Turks ended up saying, don't worry, I got you, fam, and uh, invaded the island. <laughs> Personally, I think they wanted that island anyway, because it's very strategic, and also there are ethnic Turks on the island as well. And it led to the divide that we see in Cyprus nowadays, with the northern part being predominantly Turk, southern part predominantly uh, Greek, the island still majority Greek, uh, but yeah, the northern uh, northern Cyprus is only uh, recognized by Turkey itself. That's about it. And there were talks of Cyprus, you know, finally ending the whole uh, division of the country and having it become one country again. Uh, by the way, the Brits, British are there for some reason as well. That just goes to show how strategic that place is, that you need all those different military bases there. Uh, so... The issue with Greeks and the Turks, see, after the 1920s, basically, as messed up as it is to, sound, to say, I don't think uh, Paul mentioned would, would mention this in his video, but uh, the Greeks and um, the Turks ended up uh, displacing each other. So all the Turkic, the Turkish Greeks, Greek, Greeks bleh, ended up moving to Turkey, all the Greek Turks ended up moving to Greece. So it was basically a two-pronged ethnic cleansing that happened. <sighs> yeah, that's just how it goes. But they were about to normalize relations, especially after Turkey joined NATO. And Turkey really had to join NATO because um, the very powerful and very scary Soviets were eyeing Istanbul. You know, like, maybe we should use those ports of Istanbul to our own need. And Turkey at the time, which didn't have a large population, maybe 25 million people after the Second World War, so compared to the Soviets, 280 million people and all of its natural resources, and yeah, it needed help, basically. And the Americans found Turkey very, very important, uh, arguably the second most important country in NATO and has the second most powerful 
army in NATO is Turkey, because Turkey is in control of the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits. Without that, uh, the Russians would find it very difficult to trade uh, along the Mediterranean, or to enter the Mediterranean in general. Now, after 1923, and after the signing of a treaty, I forget the name of the treaty, but basically it said the Bosphorus Strait is open to anybody to, to trade freely. That is, unless in times of war, Turkey has the right to shut down those straits so nobody can go through the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits. And, uh, yeah, relations were starting to get better with Greeks after the whole debacle of the, you know, population exchange going on. But then this happened with Cyprus, and they're still at it to this day. So that explains the Greco-Turkish relations. Retaliation to Greece's coup. Also, the southeastern part of the country where the majority Kurdish population lives is where the PKK... Uh, geez, <laughs> it hasn't even been 10 seconds and already, like... So the Kurds have been living there since antiquity, basically. The Kurdish people have never really had uh, their own state in history. And there's a reason for that. Uh, there, were n n there weren't really ever, like, well, some Kurdish states still ex did exist, but they were always vassals of some other states. And the reason is simple. They're, they're in a very poor geographic location, arguably one of the worst geographic locations you can think of smack dab in the middle of the powerful Turks, Persians, and Arabs. And for them to achieve any semblance of independence, they would have to fight all three, and that's just not viable. They're not going to survive that, which is why they never really had a state to begin with. Now, initially uh, with Ataturk, they were pretty chill with Ataturk. You know why? Because Ataturk promised that he would uh, maintain the, the status of caliph, you know, that Turkey would have the status of a, of a caliphate, basically the defender of all Muslims or something like that. Uh, but he was an atheist and he didn't have any intention of maintaining something like that. So initially they had good relations because they were both Sunni Muslims, you know, both of them. Uh, initially it was good, but afterwards he was like, yeah, psych, uh, forget that whole uh, caliphate thing. And he's just going to create a secular nation. And the, the Kurds were like, what? And, uh, and it has led to problems ever since then. And of course, there's the thing with the Armenians. Basically, the young Turks. Who... Let's just say the nationalist branch of uh, the Turks, the extreme nationalist branch of the, branch of the Turks, went berserk albeit it was it was armenia that attacked them first so a lot of armenians ended up dying in the civil strife to come and here we are today so <laughs> that's <sighs> did i summarize everything oh yeah enver pasha was actually albanian in origin am i missing something <laughs> yeah it was a very unstable period from 1923 let's say to 1980 until the economy finally started to, um, you know, gain steam. Now, when Ataturk, Ataturk took over, he it was very difficult for the country to industrialize. A lot of the people were uneducated. There was a low population. You know, it had, hadn't industrialized yet fully. Uh, it, ha it has today, of course. There's 85 million people in the country. And it has a much more modern economy, especially uh, the western parts of Turkey. Uh so he ended up changing the Turkish language, which was initially written in like a Persian Arabic script. It was very difficult for people to learn. And he ended up Latinizing the script. This is why Turkey, Turkish people today in the Turkish language uses the Latin script, thanks to him, in hopes of, uh, you know, increasing literacy faster. So it's uh, easier for people to learn. Erdogan takes over. There was a coup that happened recently. Uh, they uh, ended up entering parts of Syria. Oh God, <laughs> so much more. Uh, when it comes to details of Turkey, I I know all the details, but I can't just keep talking, can I? <laughs> I have to let the video run. Let's a just bit. move on. Yeah. In addition, Turkey has been one of the longest in limbo candidates for joining the EU. Anyway, it kind of went like this. Okay, Turkey, you've been a member of the Council of Europe. You're an associate of the ECC, and you have a customs union with us. Good, good, good. But there are 35 chapters of criteria of EU ascension. And how many have you completed? Like three. Uh, 16. <laughs> oh. Hey, 
I took in a lot of refugees. Doesn't that make me look a little bit better? I mean, I'm holding one right Bosnia now. Completed yeah, like but three. there's other <laughs> things, stuff that, nah, yeah. We're suspending all negotiations until you figure There's just a simple reason of people saying it's not a pure European country. Part of it is in, part of it is in Asia, but then again, Cyprus is part of the European Union, yet it's fully a part of the Asian continent. Uh... Also, it mentions in the Constitution they must have a European culture, and do the Turks have a European culture? Sort of. Western bits, maybe? I don't know. And it has led to this limbo state that we see today. Ah, screw it. Here's another. We seriously need to move on from all this political talk yes. and discuss something else because the comments get it's, it's a lot. Fire. Hey, I know, with all the history and unique regions, Turkey hosts a lot of notable sites of interest. To talk more on that, here's one of our Turkish geography peeps to explain. Merhaba, hi guys, my name is Janso and I would love to tell you about some of the wonderful places we have in Turkey. First off, we are obviously a land of history and there are hundreds of ancient sites that date back thousands yeah. of ancient years. Ancient city of Remember Troy. The famous Battle of Troy? Oh, there it is. Yeah, the ancient I should, I should wait. And people from the movie actually left the Trojan horse in Çanakkale. In addition, we have the Mount Nemrut head statues, Cappadocia's cave houses, Mardin sandstone building, Myra's rock tombs, and also the tomb of Santa Claus, aka Saint Nicholas. Yes, he was born in Turkey. We have old castles everywhere okay. in Turkey, in Ankara, yes. Alanya, Bodrum, Giresun, Kastamonu. And the only thing that outnumbers our castles is our ah, the It's a huge part of our culture. And it's kind of a Turkish traditional bachelor slash bachelor party. And finally, <laughs> I'm sure everyone knows about Hagia Sophia, our most famous site in Istanbul. And it's very used to be a church, to Mosque, which is another stunning piece of architecture. And last but not least, let's not forget the Grand Bazaar with 61 streets and 4,000 shops. I think that's the biggest one in the world. Bye. Thank you. The Turkish yeah, that language, was a lot though. of info, and we barely <laughs> even started the episode. Yeah. Well, let's uh, tone things down no a bit and go into the least crazy part of this episode. Let's show the natural side of Turkey, the land. The land. So Turkey's land will always find a way to shock you. Uh, one minute you're in a hazelnut forest, and the next you're in a rock forest. It's, it's a lot. So much extreme terrain, let's explain in the motion graphic. First of all, Turkey lies right at the convergence of the African, Eurasian, and Arabian plates, converging at the North and East Anatolian fault lines. This essentially creates their own mini plate known as the Anatolian plate, which is technically being pushed counterclockwise as the Arabian plate pushes up and the African plate subducts under the Cyprus arc. This means Turkey is subject to occasional earthquakes and has geothermal activity, although the majority of their volcanoes are dormant or extinct in activity. All these fault lines are what contribute to 80% or so of the country being mountainous, with three main ranges. The Pontic Mountains in the north, the Taurus Mountains in the south, in between both of these you find the Anatolian Plateau, and finally to the far east you find the Aras Mountains. This is the highest region of Turkey with the highest peak, Mount Ogridogi, or more commonly known as Ararat, which is actually a dormant compound volcano. From these mountains, the mighty rivers of Turkey flow, the longest one completely in Turkey, being the Kizlirmak or Red River, which empties into the Black Sea. It's also important to note that the source of the famous Euphrates and Tigris rivers are in Turkey as well. They flow down from the mountains and feed millions to the Middle East below. Also, uh, Yeah, this just goes to show how important uh, Turkey is geopolitically. I would actually argue, in terms of geopolitics, Turkey, along with the United States, I'd say the United States has probably the best geo geopolitical location in the world. Second place is Turkey, easily, with probably the most important city in the world, Istanbul, today. There's a reason why it has one of the largest airports in the world, because it's so damn strategic. Like, imagine a map of Euro-Afrasia, the largest island in the world. I know, technically, the Nile cuts off the African continent from... Asia, but hear me out, okay? Um, and in the middle of the Euro-Afrasian mega island lies Turkey. All the road infrastructure goes through there, the rail infrastructure goes through there, shipping goes through there, the Basra Strait, the Dardanelles, uh, the Aegean Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean, Black Sea, all of it basically in the hands of uh, Turkey. And um, it, ha it has such a very difficult, uh, since it has very rough terrain, it would, it's extremely difficult to invade. Uh, it controls basically the mouths of the 
Euphrates and Tigris rivers. And in fact, matter of fact, one Turkish politician once said to the Arabs, like, you can have all the oil you want, we'll drink your water, implying that, that uh, you know, the Turks are in control of the, the water systems, basically, kind of. But, um, yeah, that is, it is in such a good position geopolitically that uh, it has probably one of the best futures to come. Uh, if, you, if we take a look at Turkey and the countries surrounding it, it is a powerful, fairly successful economy surrounded by fairly weak countries and or fa straight up failed states, besides maybe Iran and kind of Russia. Uh, so it is in, it's basically an easy mode. It really has no powerful rivals around it. All the infrastructure you can think of goes through Tur Turkey, including gas pipelines as well, simply because it's in a location where you're born to, su to succeed. As, cr as crazy as that sounds <laughs> for a lot of Turks, they're like, hmm. Because uh, a lot of Turks tell me like, hmm, Turkey's on its way down. I, I say wrong, it's on its way up. Uh, ignore Erdogan and his crappy politics. Uh, Turkey will do very well. Um, despite its crazy inflation rate as well, it's like 80%. Not only does it have a very good position geopolitically, but it also has the perfect demographic structure as well, where the average Turk is around like 34 years old. Uh, so they're not too young, like many African countries, and they're not too old, like Japan, for example. They're, they have good geopolitics, like amazing geography. Uh, they have amazing demography. All that's left is really making... Having very strong institutions is what's left for Turkey. If they can manage that, Turkey will be one of the most successful countries in the world, easily. So, in terms of geopolitics, it is the king of geopolitics around these parts. So in this eastern area, you can find the largest lake of the Van. country, Lake Van, in the eastern Armenian highlands as well. Basically, each of the regions has their own unique distinct terrain and microclimate. The North Black Sea coast is the most lush with forests and receives the most rainfall. The Thracian Peninsula and Marmara regions are the flattest part of the country. The Aegean and southern coasts have a Mediterranean climate. The central Anatolian plateau is like the grain harvest belt of Turkey. The southeastern parts closer to Syria and Iraq are more dry and arid. Arid. And of course, in the far east, you find the tallest mountains and the coldest weather, specifically the town of Erzurum, which takes the title of the coldest place in Turkey. Also, a side note, remember, Armenians are super sensitive. That's where Salt Bay is from, you know, Mount the guy. Ararat. That... It's like sacred to them and it's on like their coat of arms and they name out all of their commercial products after it. Don't you live by a bunch of Armenians in Los Angeles? Yes, I do. How do you feel about uploading this video after you get back? Ah, uh, don't worry. It's, it's LA Armenians. They're cool with me. Plus, they're like too busy with real estate and like rooftop graves. So any <laughs> there are so many other unique natural Kardashian. sites Turkey has locked away in their domain. Dude, Cappadocia is like a different planet. So many weird eroded formations. Now this is usually the part where Noah comes in. But, I think uh, that's that place with the Turkey, so we're just hot, hot air balloons. Love you, Noah. Sorry, but we'll do your segment. So economically, Turkey is definitely a regional powerhouse classified as an emerging economy by the World Bank. They were co-founders of the OECD and are part of the G20. They are an upper middle income nation per Going capita. down. Uh, but, but anyway, by GDP standards. In fact, by market cap value, and Inca, a construction firm, and Erdemir, a steel producer, usually rank in the top five largest companies in Turkey. Not far behind is Turkish Airlines, which has more international destinations than any other airline in the world at about 130. Yeah, location, this has made location, Istanbul location. the second busiest airport in the world in terms of international passenger traffic. Every year they Just get closer behind and closer Shanghai. to dethroning Dubai. Yeah, no, no, no, I'm fine. Yeah, no, I'm still the best ever, ever that's ever existed. Shut up! In any oh, case, Dubai? Turkey is also a medical hotspot, specifically in the plastic and reconstruction of surgery department. When walking around Istanbul, don't be shocked if you find a lot of men with bandages around their heads. Oh, yeah. Turkey is the hair transplant capital of the world. And here's Arch to explain um, a little bit more. Receding hairline. Hey guys, so as you know, me and my family spend a lot of time in Turkey. So we had an idea and we did a thing. We created a five-star VIP medical tourism service called Beauty Mill, where we provide hair transplants and over 70 other cosmetic procedures what? with our doctors in Turkey. Yeah, it's a really cool experience. I was actually one of those guys. I actually had hair transplants a lot of guys are weird to talk about it but i actually did get it done i was very happy with it check it out link in the description oh art being so transparent we love it 
Shut up. Yeah, we only promote businesses on these country episodes if the business is affiliated with the country or if it is from a small business from a subscriber so that you can support them. Anyway, thank you, Art. Turkey is also a world-renowned mineral and agriculture powerhouse. Today, they are the leaders in producing things like boron, pumice, feldspar. I don't even know what feldspar is. Apricots, cherries, figs, and the national pride crop, hazelnuts. Yeah, they say we're going to eat boron sandwiches. <laughs> nice product placement. Some of this agricultural production, though, has led we're to the, the usage of underwater aquifer sources, which have led to massive sinkholes speckled throughout the interior of the country. The Konya province alone has over 300 of them, ranging in just a few meters wide to nearly 200. Yeah, they're really cool on the way to Alanya. And another thing you can <laughs> find in the environment are animals. And Gary Harlow obviously is not with us in Turkey, so... So, uh, Caleb has a baby and he has baby's duties to do today, so, uh, uh, Gabs, you're filling in. Let's just get it over with. No turkeys do not come from Turkey. The American turkey got its name from Turkey because the European settlers thought it looked like a guinea fowl from Turkey. So they called it a turkey fowl and it shortened just... it to just turkey. And that's how we got turkey. Don't ask any more questions. Right? And that's why they, like, renamed it to Turkia or whatever, Turkia, how you pronounce it. Because, um... Some people could get it confused with the actual, you know, Turkey. And like Erdogan, when it, the countries, uh, you know, made in Turkey to, you know, sound more prominent, they made in Turkey. So. All right. Turkey used to be one of the only few places that had both tigers around and lions around at the same time until they became locally extinct or permanently migrated out. Now, Turkey is the land of the cats. And it's estimated that Istanbul alone has over 200,000 stray cats. They are treated nicely by the locals who feed and tend to them. This is why you will never see either mice, rats, cockroaches in any of the major cities in Good Turkey. Good idea. Kitty cats. And if you're caught harming any of these stray cats, the community, oh brother, a whipping down. They love stray cats. I'm more cats of a cat so guy. They actually immortalize the beloved Tom Beely, the chill cat meme, cat after she passed away in 2016, so sad. Nonetheless, despite having a love of cats, the national animal is actually the gray wolf. There's a saying to describe the Turkish soul, yes, a lion or a tiger may be stronger, but you'll never see a wolf in a circus. Think about it, just think about it. So that's all the time we have for me and this hat. Dogs I guess I gotta give it back. I just, I'll, you know, I guess I'll just kind of give it back. I Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, fake Gary Harlow. I honestly so prefer mind, him. Let's than discuss Gary the Harlow. animals on people's plates. Turks are heavy meat eaters. Sorry, vegans. Which of course means we will now discuss the food. Oh of no! Turkey. Everybody, we'll somebody hold me. Of, uh, that guy is insane. Have you seen the size of Look the platters that, that, that guy makes? Well, we don't have him with us right now, but we do have you guys, the Turkish geography peeps, to explain a little bit more on the food and cuisine of Turkey. Hey, everyone. A lot of Bosnian cuisine, go figure, is based off of Turkish cuisine, which is why I love it a lot. <laughs> I'm Rabia. Hey everyone, it's Furkan. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the food of Turkey. So, Turkish cuisine is based on a fusion of all the surrounding cultures they were in contact with throughout the history. You'll find hints of flavors and ingredients from Mediterranean, Central Asia, Caucasus, Very biased and the Middle East. Fun comes fact, to Swedish meatballs Turkish is food. actually originated from here. King Charles XII was on exile and brought back the recipe for köfte from Ottoman Empire. Also, keep in mind we love putting yogurt on everything, especially if it's oh seasoned God, with things like so garlic good. and mint. Actually, it's not yogurt, it's yogurt. İskender, bamyada olması, lahmacun, gelincik böreği, çaputaşı pilavı, mantı, çiğ Sağ köfte, <laughs> sarma, kuru fasulye, kısır, kokoreç, menemen, and of course, the most famous dishes you've probably heard of already, doner oh and kebab. Keep in mind, you might have seen restaurants called doner kebab. There's no such thing. There are two separate items. Doner, which is cooked on a turning spit, and kebab, Love which is it. cooked on a skewer. This is the Love best it. part. We have a lot of desserts too. Turkish delight, lokum, which is quite famous, I guess. Kadayıf, künefe. Maraş ice cream. The first guy who's turned this thing. Yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking oh, about. The guy that Dutch. won't give you your your ice cream. Bombers. <laughs> It literally means a bomb. In market, you might find Ottoman margin candy. Also, we have many drinks as well. For one, we are the highest consumers of tea out of any country in the world. And just like other nations in the... <clears throat> oh, oh, that almost went down my throat. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, uh, Bosnian coffee. If you come to Bosnia, a lot of times you'll have Bosnian coffee, which is just based off of Turkish coffee. 
So there you go. Balkans, we love drinking our Which I drink a lot. Drink we also have things like sherbet, salep, boza, shalgam, and rakı. And of course, if you have the chance, try some Turkish coffee. Thank you. Yeah, Turkish coffee is you not about one? the type of bean they use, but rather the way it's prepared. They will boil water in a jezva, yes, jezva with jezva. incredibly fine ground coffee, almost to the point where it's like powder, and then they serve it with the grinds, yeah. no, no filtering. Sometimes we even do this thing where we heat up the pot in a heated sand pit, so the coffee is actually baked, not boiled. Also, I learned this the first time I met Ege. After you finish drinking your coffee, you can tell your fortune. They like lift it upside down and then they look at the coffee grinds and you like come up with a fortune. Uh, there's even an app for that, I think. Like they check the coffee grinds? Yeah. I Bosnia has something similar to this. We don't look at the coffee grinds, but instead, like when we pour the coffee, there's a bit of like foam on the top. And like uh, if you're sitting down on a table with your family, whoever the <laughs> whichever direction the foam ends up landing, you know, going towards like that person has gains a wish very strange <laughs> okay but it's a thing apparently in bosnia and uh oh before i start the video i should also mention they have the oldest war anthem in the world Chedin Dedan. some of you might have heard of it but there's another fun fact out there that uh Maybe Paul won't mention it. I think so. You can, like, scan it. Yeah, that's the other thing I noticed. Turkish people have a lot of superstitions and rituals that they kind of live by. Yeah, that's a whole another story. We'll talk Don't more cut about your nails on Sunday. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or clip your nails, So, what is a Turk? This is not a simple question to answer, especially since Turkey has gone through so much change in the past several millennia. First, we need to make the quick distinction between the terms Turk and Turkic. Turk or Turkish are used interchangeably to refer to someone from Turkey. Turkic refers to the Turkic ethnic group, a family broken down into six main branches that extend all the way from Turkey to Siberia. This means, yes, Turkish people are distant cousins of people like Siberians, Kazakhs, Uyghurs, Uzbeks, Tatars, and so on. Ethnographers speculate that they are even intertwined with Uralic and Ugric people groups. Wait, so even we're related to them? By weird, technical, long-distance default, kind of, yes? And even Viktor Orban says that they're related to the Turks. <laughs> so there's something going on. That being said, Many Turks in Turkey today are probably a genetic admixture of who knows what from anywhere and everywhere that got in contact with the Anatolian Peninsula over the past two millennia. You can find everything from blonde-haired, blue-eyed Turks to, yes, even a small community of Afro-Turks. In any case, if you want an actual visual of how the country breaks down ethnically, uh, here's the demographics graph. First of all, the country has a population of about 85 million people and is host to the largest refugee population on Earth. Now here's where things get a little complicated because Turkey doesn't really have super reliable data on ethnic statistics of their country, and the term Turk is defined by the constitution as anyone that is bound to the Turkish state through citizenship, which means any citizen is considered Turk regardless of ethnic background. It is also known that there are about 50 non-Turkish ethnic groups represented as well. in the country. Nonetheless, independent sociologists have speculated that somewhere around 70 to 80 percent of the country would most likely identify as ethnic Turks to whatever degree that may be. From there, the largest minority group are Kurds, estimated to be anywhere from 12 up to 20-ish maybe percent of the country. From there, the remainder of the population are other ethnic groups, mostly Arabs, Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, Circassians, Bosniaks, Roma, and so on. There we use the are. Turkish Lira <laughs> as our currency, we use the type CNF plug out list, and we drive on the right side of the road. Speaking of driving, uh, I learned that pretty much everybody outside of Istanbul hates the license plate number 34. Yes, we do. Every province has a number, and uh, 34 is Istanbul. And mine is 39. You have it on your <laughs> chest. Yes. 39. Uh, and people usually chest. keep crowbars in their cars and stuff. In, in any case of a fight, or in case Freeman. of a fight breaks yeah. out, you guys have weapons in your cars. Yes. Language-wise, they're playing Half-Life Turkish too, is the official language. It is written in the Latin script. It was actually adopted in 1928, replacing a modified Arabic script prior to that. Our ancestors actually used our own versions of the old Gökturk and Uyghur alphabets, which had these cool jagged blade-shaped letters that would later inspire the old Hungarian alphabet. Man, I guess we do have some weird connection to you guys, huh? Now going back to the people of Turkey, as we mentioned, Turkey is also pretty diverse. As mentioned, the Kurds are the largest minority, mostly concentrated in the southeastern provinces bordering Iraq and Syria. We already did a video explaining about the Kurds and who they are, but basically... Yeah, regards to like the PKK or whatever, the Kurds. The thing is, when they were in civil strife with the Turks, there was uh, another Kurdish group, I can't remember now, like fighting against the Kurds as well. So the Kurds fight amongst each other as well. And yes, like it says there, they are an Iranic people. 
Not ironic, ironic. <laughs> they are a stateless, ironic group of people related to the Persians and Pashtuns. They speak their they own language. They have autonomy. Completely unrelated to Turkish, and they are spread across four countries in the Middle East, mostly in Turkey, though. And since we're already on the topic, uh, let's just get it over with and rip off the Armenia Band-Aid thing. Okay, I'm just gonna say this. During the transition years of becoming a republic, there were lots of fighting, and the Armenians, being assisted by Russians, was heavily involved. Since then, Armenia has requested the Turkish government acknowledge the incident as a genocide, whereas Turkey's government, to some extent, will acknowledge that tragedies have occurred. However, the narrative is He's more twitching. nuanced, and they would not use the word genocide. This is the basic foundation of the argument. Yeah, in Turkish schools, the incident is taught as tehcir, which is a displacement. And some Ottoman officials who abused their power and mistreated the displaced Armenians were hanged. But keep in mind, this is the official Turkish government story. So this make up your own mind. Make up your, your mind. Own this is what the Turkish government says. Yes. Yeah, Talk about it in ding, the comments. Ding, ding, ding. For what yeah, deportation law. They deported the Armenians right into the Syrian desert. So worth though on a mundane personal level turks often can be just befriend people like armenians Kur kurds and greeks it's not like they're like oh when they meet each other it's like they can, they can interact with each other yeah i just made a greek friend like two days ago we have that footage mike was really cool mike we, we were you, really uh you know hitting it off you were vibing man <laughs> yeah you're, like you a guys, lot of things are in common you use like the same words you like yeah. have the same everything like yeah like, we're basically from thrace both of us three same people it's like it's like one people it's crazy and another thing being close to conflict zones turks Turkey has become the largest refugee host Mostly in the Syrians. world, with about 4 million, including nearly 65% of the entire world's registered Syrian refugees. Supposedly, the number is up for debate because a lot of people also just cross over and they don't yeah. register, so... It's 100% higher than that. Well, with that, let's talk about another part of Turkey's identity, religion. Although... So yeah, the, those refugees have been there for so long. It's been many years since the... Syrian civil war that they bet their, like, refugee communities have started up their own little economy. And own little like uh, neighborhoods. It's been so damn long, so it's kind of sad. Secular by constitution, according to the government's old registration system, about 98% of the country claims to be Muslim to whatever degree oh, of yeah, actual the devotion. The majority at about 75% being Sunni affiliated with the Hanafi school of jurisprudence. Uh, well, in the past, people were uh, supposed to have a registration for their religion, and if they had just one Muslim parent, they would be automatically registered as Muslim. The data is probably a little bit skewed. For what it's worth, historically, before Ottoman times, the lands Turkey lied in used to be very Christian. Like, literally half of all the cities in the New Testament of the Bible that the Apostle Paul visited refer to current renamed cities of Turkey like Ephesus, Tarsus, Lycia. Even the ecumenical patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church is located in Istanbul. It's interesting though because despite the Islamic undertones, Turkey and often their Turkic co cousins can be very superstitious and fall into practices like fortune telling and astrology. It's even. huge out here. Yeah. So like technically it's considered haram but like you guys still do it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. You'll so is alcohol. In Turkey, there's always kind of like a dichotomy or it. fusion between the Islamic side and the Turkic side of people's identity. And that's the other thing too. Like a lot of times people kind of conflate you guys with Arabs because uh, no. Islam usually gets tied in with Arabism so much. Yeah, we're like yeah, and funnily enough, Bosniaks get uh, confused with Turks because the Bosniaks got the religion from the Turks. Now, regarding to the Bosniaks, the relations between them and Turkic Turkish people, um, uh, after the Turks came into Bosnia, they took over the place, a lot of the population in Bosnia started converting en masse to Islam for a myriad of reasons, um, especially the old Bogomil uh, sect of Christianity, which uh, the Bosniaks were a part of, and a lot of them, including a lot of uh, Orthodox uh, Christians and uh, Catholics as well, uh, joined in, and we would have the Bosniaks today, the Muslims. Not all of them are Muslim, of course, uh, but uh, the the largest people group in Bosnia today. And um, yeah, the history goes way back. Uh, like a lot of Bosniaks have held uh, lots of powerful positions in the Ottoman government. Um, a lot of Bosniaks even fought alongside Turks many times to for it to gain their independence. Uh, that's why a lot of Bosniaks live there today. A lot have been moving there historically, especially around parts of Bursa, I, t I was told. And also there's a neighborhood called Yeni Bosna in uh, Istanbul, where you would find a lot of uh, Bosniak uh, people. So yeah, I mean, we go way back. We go way back. We're like the least Arabized Muslim majority country. But like people don't seem to understand that. <laughs> yeah. And one thing they've upheld for thousands of years are their recreational activities. With that, here's art with the sports part. I had to write something. 
All right, guys, turkey and sports. But first, guess what? Tarchin's name is actually Turkish, and it means cinnamon. I was That's told that recently. For, buddy. So, uh, yeah. he didn't die, don't Because I believe uh, his wife is actually from Azerbaijan, and the Azer Azeris and Turks, believe it or not, actually share a common origin. Yeah, Azeris are also Turkic people group, so I heard their languages are very similar but uh, the turks say the azeris speak with a funny accent so sometimes it's hard to understand them but yeah but basically the azeris are a majority shia people well nowadays they're largely atheists thanks to the soviet union times and uh the turks are sunnis so don't worry first off they have lots of native sports every year on the west coast they have the seljuk camel wrestling festival in which male camels would naturally fight each other for mates so they decided to make it a sport that's what they fight for uh mating they're heavily monitored by referees okay. and are muzzled so they don't bite each other another sport did it a horseback javelin throwing sport so here's a clip from the movie Bayaz Melek showing how it's done in a safe and cinematically choreographed Spahi manner. Horseman. And finally, you've probably heard of this one, Turkish oil wrestling. This is most famous in the Thrace region, done on a grass field wearing heavy water buffalo pants. You have to either expose your opponent's belly upwards, make them fall to the side, or carry them for a few steps. They're covered in olive oil to make grappling difficult, oh, meaning so wrestlers greasy. of different weights can wrestle fairly using speed and technique while also repelling mosquitoes. Why'd you say that uh, as a question? <laughs> because why are mosquitoes important, right? We're saying what the olive oil is for. It's to repel mosquitoes. It can be that too. Take out the Oh, so that's why the ancient Greece Greeks covered themselves in olive oil when they were heading to the gym. It all makes sense now. I thought that was just a weird thing Gre ancient Greeks do because they did a lot of weird things but apparently it, it made sense for them to do it mosquitoes bro shut up Archie, say it. <laughs> otherwise turks have done pretty well in many other contemporary sports they've gathered over 100 medals in the olympics since debuting in 1908 their strongest event being wrestling with a total of 29 golds as of 2020 tokyo olympics turkey's women's volleyball teams have won numerous european championship titles and medals and of course turks will tell you so much about their accomplishments in soccer or football these three teams are the most attention grabbing ben clubs Bahce. in the entire country when there is a derby between them the fans go oh yeah the, uh, this is just a sh sound Besiktas, and this is a ch sound Fenerbahce. okay uh Bos bosnian language would do something similar to this but they would have like a, a karen over, over the sh and the ch the s and the c yeah that's a fun fact that that weird symbol you see in slavic languages over in, it's called a karon c-a-r-o-n karon okay so there are a lot of turkish words uh in the bosnian language for example celik cekic celik is steel cekic is hammer and even the name for vienna we don't say vienna or something in bosnian we call it bitch which is the way the turks called the city of vienna crazy people get violent and police have to be present to stop the fans from stabbing each other otherwise they were super pumped when they reached third place in the 2002 world cup and this guy hassan sakur holds the record for fastest goal in the world cup i mean there's so much to discuss about turkish football but you know i'm gonna let you guys Mehmet Kahveci. you guys can call each other little is and you can verbally assault each other all right guys that's all i got for you for the turkey episode Fair if enough. you guys <laughs> are interested in getting some cosmetic work done you can visit us at beautymill.travel in turkey yeah. does he really the have lamest, like most tame exit you've ever had art screw you paul oh, yeah. oh thank you art <laughs> have football. people died at these soccer fights uh, i don't think many might might have maybe maybe it's possible don't quote me on that yeah, that's another thing about your it's culture probable. and to talk a they have died about in bosnia hooligans have Hannah. attacked each other sure if she can do this segment but what's better i'm pulling it rest in peace <laughs> busy uh she's in alabama doing alabama stuff so uh we got hannah too uh her stunt double no it's just me gabriel gab barbs is really pulling me into this episode <laughs> really getting all he can out of me so turkish culture what is it exactly turks are obsessed with hygiene you're often going to find them with handkerchiefs or mendel and every turk has a bottle of colonia it's like a perfume that they pour on their hands to cool down or if they're just generally stressed it actually doesn't even originate in turkey it comes from germany when greeting elders what they'll do is they'll grab the hand and they'll kind of kiss it and then they'll put it on the forehead and then when men greet each I know other, that from they me. shake hands a boosh a little concussion there and a little concussion there oh they also do the I know that from thing. Turkish series lifestyle. let me tell you Turkish uh 
soap operas and series are super popular in Bosnia. My God, my mom cannot get enough of that stuff. <laughs> or my dad, too, technically. Boom to the left. Boom to the right. There are a lot of superstitions in Turkey. The most famous one that everybody knows of is Nazar, the evil eye. The concept, it exists in other countries, but it is huge in Turkey. It's basically the idea of getting bad luck because someone else is jealous of you. This is why you're going to see the Nazar porcelain glass amulet. It's everywhere in Turkey. Sometimes oh, people that's will take what that it is. put it on things that people will get jealous of. Or they'll even put it on people too. Yeah, and a lot of those Turkish soap operas, it shows how like someone is jealous of somebody because they have the person that they want or everything that they want. So, Also, is that Jesus right there? This is also just an icon of Jesus and a cross right there in Turkey. Okay, maybe pro probably the Turkish Greeks. There's still Greeks in Turkey left. Okay, not all of them are left for Greece. Anything. You know what? The rituals are just too too crazy for me to explain. Here's some of the subscribers who could do a much better job than me. So, we Turks have a lot of quirks. Turks do this thing where they <laughs> grab their earlobe, make a kiss sound, and knock the wood. It is believed that eating okay. of the right hand means getting unexpected money from somewhere. Cutting your S exact same superstition in Bosnia. So this one too, cutting the nails at night or in on Sundays for some reason in Bosnia as well. So that's where it's from. It's all from Turkey. Though the youth nowadays don't really, you know, follow this anymore. It's kind of dying out with the old people here in Bosnia. The youth, of course, knows know it as just being a superstition. Your nails at night are seen as things which would attract bad luck. Don't lend a sharp object to people. Either spit on it or else you could be in a Same. fight. Don't in eat in a bathroom or bed or you will get haunted. I was scared for this when I was a kid. You should enter the house and use household with your right foot. Exact same in Bosnia. someone is taking a long trip with their car, people generally pour water behind them. This one's not a thing in Bosnia. you pair of shoes, you should let the first person who noticed them step on them. Turks have this gesture. They do when they get scared. They bite their thumb and push it up. Slippers cannot be upside down at all. When you drop mm. bread on the floor, you have to kiss it and put it on your forehead three times. Don't have too that much fun. Bosnia. Don't laugh <laughs> too much or something bad could happen. What? I especially like that one. Otherwise, Turkey has a world-renowned entertainment industry. Even people in Brazil love Turkish drama. Probably the most famous drama abroad being this one, which translates to what is Fatma Gul's wrong doing? What would you do, Fatma Gul? I want to know. Also, Turkish movies are really popular as well. However, Turkish humor is so specific that it's almost impossible to translate the inside joke, like the cult classic movie Gora. And it's highly regarded as the most popular movie from Turkey. Now, it's basically about a Turkish scam artist fellow who gets abducted by uh, some extraterrestrials. And then the whole movie is just making fun of Hollywood from the Turkish perspective. <laughs> Looks Finally, like Matrix. Turkey's a home to many festivals and celebrations. This rock festival actually got canceled this year. The district administration said it was too loud and too disturbing for the locals. But are those the real reasons? Oh, we're just never going to know. And speaking of loud and disturbing, here's our favorite Florida man, Keith. All right, come back. <laughs> Did you guys miss me? I hope everybody's doing well. Let's get to it. I'm Keith. We're supposed to talk about music. Uh, well, this is an intense one because, you know, uh, they have a lot of history. I mean, who doesn't know the Ottoman Empire and, you know, woo! You'll hear lots of elements similar to Greek, Arab, Romanian, and Armenian Turkish music. Hmm. I wonder why. There are three main styles of folk. The Black Sea, the West Coast, and the South Coast all have their own different styles of folk music. On the Black Sea Coast, the Kemenche is played, and when they dance, there's a lot of shoulder shaking, gesture like this. In the West Same Coast, dance there's Bosnia. the uh, Zabek dance, Jumbush. I'm sorry if I just absolutely butchered that. Um, it's like a banjo without frets. Um, I don't know if it's tuned in fifths or not, I potentially tuned in fifths. In the South, you means. hear more arabesque music. It's slower and more depressing, like super depressing. People literally will commit self-harm at some of these concerts that are performed by this dude. In fact, the 80s was kind of like the super popular okay. depressing era of music in Turkey. It was kind of like their goth phase. You have all <laughs> these really great artists that will be listed over here. Turkey has a lot of traditional bards, like these guys. 
Now let's get into some of the modern stuff that goes on in Turkey now. Anatolia rock, this is probably one of the most famous contemporary genres to have come out of Turkey. It's like a fusion of like Western rock, psychedelic, and like saz instruments. Oftentimes they're remixed with traditional Turkish songs. There's so much we could have mentioned like Turkish pop and there's a lot of Turkish rap and so forth. But if you have something to add, please add it in the comment section down below. I'd love to respond to you guys. Thank you so much to everybody that subscribed to my YouTube channel. The what about when they came like third in Eurovision with that song? Uh, I forget the name of the singer, but uh, help me out here. Can you feel the rhythm in my heart? The beats going doom tech tech. Eh? Uh, Hadiz. I forgot her name. <laughs> oh God. But yeah, that, that song should have won Eurovision then. So Keith Everett show. It's been really great. Y'all have a good one. I voted one. for them. Whee! Thank you, Keith. So, by the way, if you want to hear uh, metalcore slash emo music in Turkish language, <laughs> Turkish emo metalcore. Yeah, check out it. my uh, musical project called "As My Life Falls Apart." It's on all platforms. You can find the sounds music everywhere. Stuff. It actually sounds kind of good. I'm surprised. You, Thank you. You do like all the tracks and the layers. And you, these kids are actually pretty good. Uh, yeah, promotion for you, Ege. Thank you, man. You are in this episode, so You're why not? Well, with that, there is only one part left to this complicated nation of Turkey. They're Diplomacy. Here we go. Bosnia best friend. Uh, probably so as Azerbaijan. As a country at the crossroads of three continents, Turkey is in a position where they can't really isolate, even if they tried. There's geographically too much going on. Let's explain. For one, Indonesia has always been a close ally dating back centuries when the Ottomans supported the people of Aceh against the Portuguese. Since the Cold War, the USA has always been involved in Turkey's diplomatic affairs, especially in concern to Soviet expansion. They joined NATO in 1952, recognized Israel in 1948. Many Turkish Jews voluntarily moved to Israel as well during Zionist movement times, and Turkey even sent troops to to fight alongside the Korean War. In fact, Turkey has had close ties to South Korea dating over 2,000 years when the Guk Turks teamed up and assisted the Korean Goguryeo Kingdom against the Tang Dynasty Chinese forces in conflict times. Since then, they've maintained a historical alliance based on economic, cultural, and military traits all the way up to the Korean War. Today, about 460 fallen Turkish soldiers are buried in honor at the Hero Cemetery in Busan. Bosniaks from Bosnia and Herzegovina are also huge fans. They are kind of like the descendants of European Muslims that converted during Ottoman times. Many have even moved to Turkey as well and started business and have communities. Then we get to their Central Asian cousins. Turks have a platonic love for their Central Asian cousins like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan, and so on. They'll always take up the opportunity to follow up and chat. Turkmenistan is a little bit of a different story due to their government's isolationist policies, but as people, the Turkmens and Turks are probably the closest in Central Asia because of the Oguz tribe affiliation. Germany is their largest import and export partner. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Oguz or Guz means like autumn in Turkish? Also, if you say Guz in Bosnian, it means something funny. <laughs> they have the largest Turkish diaspora outside of Turkey, so there has always been a connection between them. Turks tend to have strong opinions about the Turkish diaspora in Germany, but that's a whole other story that we do not want to get into right now. In regards to Cyprus, obviously we already explained in the Cyprus episode, the northern Turkish populated part is a self-proclaimed independent nation that only Turkey recognizes, so of course there is a close connection there. Turks tend to call northern Cyprus Yavru Vatan, which means little homeland. But keep in mind, Cypriot Turks don't actually really like this phrase. When it comes to their best friends, however, every Every Turk I've talked to has said one country, Azerbaijan. They have a phrase, one nation, two states. If the Central Asian Turkic nations are cousins, then the Turks and Azerbaijanis are siblings. They have mutually intelligible dialects, they intermarry a lot, each is super welcome in each other's country. Overall, they are one blood, always have been, always will be. All right, and in conclusion, Ege, you are the Turk. You get the honor. Speak from the heart. Go! Nice flank. It's so complicated. It has a history going back millennia. Just like the land, it has blended people from the Aegean, Mediterranean, Mesopotamian, Europe, and Middle East, ancient Turkics. Uh, it's secular, but also has a Muslim undertone. The politics are always insane. There is never a quiet moment. And no matter how many crowbars you get in the face from road rage, we always dish it out over a tulip glass of tea. I think that uh, summarizes it great, Ege. Thank you so much for being in the turkey you, episode man. and uh stay tuned turkmenistan is coming up next this one was my favorite by far <laughs> oh boy we're still not done with the video how long have i been going oh this might be the longest geography now video somebody mentioned in the comments once that I, he bets that like the the geography now turkey episode is going to be the longest geography now episode and you're probably absolutely correct <laughs> 
Oh boy, here we go. All right, hey to the 14 subscribers that are gonna watch this video. So as of right now, I am I'm in one of Korea those. visiting my grandma. So I have no choice. I gotta film on location. We've done this before, so nothing new. I'm sitting on a floor mattress. Hope you liked the turkey episode. Okay, so let's talk about some of the small mistakes we made in the episode. For one, I accidentally used the physical geography slide in place of the political geography slide. When Ege was talking about the ancient this. site of Chatalhuk, he accidentally said 10,000 BC when he meant to say 10,000 years ago. And even then it's still disputed whether it's like nine to 12,000 years old, whatever. Uh, I horribly pronounced the word Agredol and it's it's a hard word to pronounce because like the G with the thing over it makes like a W sound kind of, or like, like a silent sound. I don't know, Turkish is hard. Now that I've heard a lot of Turkish, it, to me it kind of sounds like a lot of like <laughs> a lot of like <laughs> and and sounds. Well, also in the political geography animation, when I said Turkey only owns two islands in the Aegean, it's not technically true true they do have some small islands and islets off their coast but the two biggest main ones are up in the north stuff i didn't mention in the episode turkey is a conscription country however you can kind of get out of it it's a complicated system but technically all males above 18 are required to serve their country somehow also fun fact the iron i'm drinking in the episode is actually bulgarian iron man a lot of people they hate that i actually like it it's like a sour fermented milk drink i like sour one thing we didn't mention uh according to herodotus the Lydians, ancient people in what was now Turkey, were the first people to use gold and silver currency. We didn't talk too much about the PKK and the controversy with the Greeks. Basically, the PKK is a Kurdish political party and they are recognized by many like countries as or a terrorist organization. They have gone into... I didn't speak much about it because I haven't looked that much into it, but there has been civil strife between them uh, and the Turks. Uh, I do know that some Kurds actually fought against them as well. That I do know, but... Have I looked into who, what they are, what they represent, the PKK and everything? I honestly have not. I've never gotten around to it, so that's why I kind of like shoulder shrug to it. Lots of guerrilla warfare tactics. They've attempted coups. Well, the Kurdish people say like the the only friend in our world uh, are the mountains. The only friends in our world are the mountains, implying that yeah, nobody is willing to help them, and uh, they can they're just left on their own and fighting in the mountains because the mountains provide some cover. But uh, every attempt the Kurds have tried has been a failure, or the Turks have ended it up being victorious on the Turkish government Kurdish people we already explained the whole Kurdish situation thing in another episode but long story short when you say Kurd Turks have a lot of opinions and Kurds have a lot of opinions on Turks too it's like it goes both ways as for the Greeks I mean during the transition period when Turkey was trying to become a republic the entire area of Izmir and much of the Thracian Peninsula was actually occupied by Greece during the partition years and they there already were a lot of Greeks there then after independence things went crazy a lot of fighting greeks were kicked out of ismir and uh yeah there's a lot more that goes into it but that's the basic gist of it which is why greece had some controversy with turkey in the past look into it do your own research all right so that's just about it for that part uh we gotta start the episode we didn't even start yet sheesh okay uh cue the intro slide and without further ado okay good it's not too loud <laughs> actually it is kind of loud now, the Turkey episode was really fun because I got to go there and I got to meet a, around 60 of you guys in both Izmir and Istanbul. It was really cool meeting you guys. You guys showed me around. We ate some lunch and then we got some drinks. I treated you guys and then I got a drone shot and it was awesome. Uh, I just want to say a quick sorry to two geography peeps that I feel bad for, Batu and Ejegul. Uh, they volunteered to be in the episode, but uh, I, I just, I couldn't use your footage because the video was already getting really long and we had a lot of people volunteering to be in the episode. I'm really sorry, but I just want to say a huge thanks to you guys for at least attempting to be in the episode, so thank you. All right, so with that, uh, let's move on to the flag. It's a pretty simple one, but uh, there's a little bit of a backstory. Let's begin. The flag of Turkey is often referred to as the red flag or al Bayrak. It's a red banner directly derived from the former Ottoman flag that was used throughout the empire since the late 1700s. Now you would think the white crescent and star represents Islam, but according to historians and legend accounts, the imagery actually originates as far back as the Greek colony of Byzantium, 
around 300 BC. Eventually, it was adopted and used as an iconographic symbol for the Ottoman Empire under Osman I, who claimed to have had a dream that basically involved a crescent and moon. And you know, the Ottoman Empire being Islamic and a caliphate at the same time, these images kind of became associated with Islam, despite not having a grounded origin in the faith. Some also say the crescent is used to honor the religious affiliations of the nation and its people, while the white star represents the diversity of the Turkish cultures. And a lot of Muslim countries ended up adopting the crescent uh, moon and star because in hopes of, you know, one, it's a symbol for Islam, and two, they, they hoped to become, you know, one day as powerful as the Ottomans were. So, so yeah. And also the red stands for... I knew it did. <laughs> Thank you once again, our favorite Irishman, Potts, for making that animation. Did you get the reference? Uh, cat, van, van, van, van, van, cat, van, van, cats. Ah, ha, ha, ha. They have heterochromia. Anyway, so that's the flag. And honestly, we don't need a coat of arms section because the, they have a national emblem, but it's just the star and crescent. And we just literally explained it for the flag. So just uh, one little extra side note. You might see the flag of the self-declared independent state of Northern Cyprus alongside the Turkish flag very often, as Turkey is the only country that recognizes their sovereignty. It's basically the same symbolism, except the two red stripes on the top and bottom represent both Northern Cyprus and Turkey. A lot of controversy we could get into with that but we're not going to instead we're gonna go to <laughs> geography and mail time the end of the video oh this might be the longest one yet might be we'll see during editing uh by the way this was a this was a good one this was a fun one. Oh boy there's so much more i could have mentioned but you know what i'm just gonna leave it there and i'll mention the rest some other day some other time Otherwise, I'd like to thank all my Patreon patrons for supporting me. I'm still working on the book, by the way. And if you made it to the end of the episode, I am going. I, I am proud to present the cover photo for my book. There it is. Coming soon to a bookshelf near you, I guess. Do be expecting that. I'm still working on it. I have been sidetracked so many times by so many things. But it's almost done. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and as always, take care.